Hi and welcome back everyone to Rabbit Hole Stories, where we close the arc, Ian, on interviewing <laughs> the Relay team. <laughs> we got through the whole team, I think. Yeah, mostly, yeah. No, they're a great, great bunch of guys and, and Adam is no, ex- you know, he's no exception. He's he, he, CTO and co-founder of Relay and uh, we got a little bit technical, but it was very palatable mm. for, for people like myself who aren't that technical in, in the ecosystem, but it was nice sort of to to sort of learn a little bit about how the tech side works a little bit within the Bitcoin ecosystem. And Mm -hmm. and one takeaway I got from it for me personally was the importance and significance actually of um, the people like Adam in in the ecosystem that is Bitcoin, because they're the ones actually building the bridge. And I think you mentioned this towards the end of the episode, They're, they're actually building the bridge that really has to take on the weight of the entire world to be onboarded Mm -hmm. into the ecosystem. And, um, that, you know, so I think I, I certainly take that for granted sometimes. Um, you know, I think, you know, Bitcoin's running in the background, TikTok next block. But actually, there's a lot of people doing a lot of technical stuff mm-hmm. in the background to make it uh, available to the masses. So that's that's the takeaway I took from this episode. Yeah, I um, when he mentioned, like, you know, um, your guys see or hear what we mean. Um, like, there's a protocol level and we also need to think about solutions like Relay, for example, that bring it up to... Uh, end users who make it simple, easy to use, fast. I was like, oh shit, that m- must have been like 25 years ago if you worked in like the internet industry, I guess, if you like worked right, on the yeah. first browser, on, like Netscape or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And you're thinking about the most mundane problems, which are normal for us, but for like the normal, real normal people, not weirdos who <laughs> like to talk about Orange Coin all day. Um, <laughs> that is quite a quite a burden they take on, and um, I, I hope um, everyone is as excited as we are right now to also hear when lightning on relay. So, without any further ado, um, let's go down the rabbit hole with Adam, and um, yeah, we're all mad here. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to yet another episode of Rabbit Hole Stories. Today, we've got Adam with us, who's the CTO and co-founder of Relay. How are you, Adam? Pretty good. Thank you. How are you guys? Yeah, we're very good. Thank you so much. Um, It's uh, another hot day in London today. It's been miserable yesterday, but um, I'm starting to get a little bit of a tickle in my throat. So if if I sound a little bit hoarse, uh, I do apologize. It's only because of the usual typical four seasons in one day in London. Uh, (laughs) But welcome to uh, Rabbit Hole Stories. Um, As you are probably aware, uh, we're interested in how everyone who comes onto the podcast discovered Bitcoin and um, we go with them down their rabbit hole of how they discovered it, why they stayed in the ecosystem that is Bitcoin and what is it that they're doing in in the ecosystem today. So uh, some people start off uh, from before they discover Bitcoin and link it back somehow. Some people just sort of go straight into, I discovered Bitcoin at this time. So we just leave it open for you to um, invite us down this Bitcoin rabbit hole with you and uh, we'll go from there. Sure. Sounds good. All right. So I, I am a techie. So as a, a CTO, obviously he was always around uh, tech stuff and all. And that's how I got into into Bitcoin. So I think it's the quite usual way for, for people in the in the tech world most of the time, not always. So it's it's very close to that. I I'm from France. I, I I was born and grew up in in Bordeaux, and I would so I I learned English quite late in my career. I would say uh, I I had to move to the Netherlands to force myself to uh, to speak English, and my main source of tech news was always French blogs, French blog posts with anything related to tech. And there was one called Sam and Max. So it was two guys writing this blog post and it was super interesting because they were not only writing about tech, but also about other crazy things, even sometimes about sex. So I I really found this super interesting, this mix of technology and and a few other things that they, they felt super open to discuss about anything in that blog. It doesn't exist anymore. It's been archived. So I think, I think the archives, you can still find it, uh, somewhere online, but the blog itself doesn't exist anymore. And one day while just again reading and at the time I used RSS. So for, uh, for those who don't know, it was maybe the 
Twitter 1.0, the early days where you could follow the news and all via an RSS reader. And, and one day I just received one more article from them. I can't remember what was the article about, but uh, they were a lot into Python at the time. Mm. Then I just go to the to the blog post and I see on the on the side panel a new um, section where they I still remember how it was written in in French it was written on adore les sioux as in we love money but in a, in a funny way and just the next line was a Bitcoin wallet address a legacy wallet address. Uh, at the time, I didn't know what it was. I didn't even know legacy, but I knew that this was something around uh, digital money. And, and that's it. I just stayed there. To be honest, I have never been at the time. I didn't went through more details to read about Bitcoin or anything, but I heard about Bitcoin and that triggered a bit of interest. So I, I looked around a little bit. I can't remember the price, but I know it was in cents for sure, uh, below one dollar. And I just passed. I just passed. And um, very painful to remember these days now, but I just passed fine. Uh, and then only a few years later, so around 2017, I think, which is quite the common date for, <laughs> for most of the... Um, uh, crypto, let's say, because I was a no coiner, shit coiner, and then Bitcoiner. Uh, again, very common, I believe. Uh, I started all about reading about the, the whole blockchain technology because I was getting really interested on the, the technical aspect. At the time, I was becoming independent. So I'm coming from an academic background. I studied bioinformatics, a mix of uh, biology and informatics, where we would write scripts to analyze some biological data to get the meaning out of this data. It was the, the era of, of big data. So we were just bombarded by a lot of data every day to, to analyze. But I always wanted to build something on my own. And during my, my PhD, as a, as a side project, I was building mobile applications. At the time, it was just games for, for kids. Not, not my own games, but I was just uh, doing contractor jobs for, uh, for someone who wrote a, a book for kids. And I realized I was making money. And in academia, after my PhD, I also did a quick postdoc. But I felt like it was not for me because, because there was competition where I thought they shouldn't be competition. Like I really didn't like the fact that in academia they were competing. Uh, I got scooped during my PhD. So some other groups were doing the same job. They published before me. So all my job went to trash. Anyway, I just always had, since I can remember since probably school, high school already had some side projects where I could make just a little bit of money and always wanted to build something on my own. And, and then I, I left academia and built my own small uh, software development company where I focused in, in blockchain. Because at the time I was reading around blockchain and all, but I, I found it still very complicated. Even for someone who is very techy like me, I, I felt the, the, the struggle. And the fact that I was in mobile app development was, was pretty clear to me that the, the mobile app platform is the bridge that we need if we really want to reach that mass adoption we are all dreaming about. At the time, I was not thinking mass adoption, hyper Bitcoinization, but mass adoption cryptocurrencies, because I really believed anyway that this was the next level when it comes to uh, the financial world. And then I built uh, one, two mobile wallets for a few uh, crypto projects. And around that time, 2019, that's where we met with, uh, with Julian. And he played a big role in actually opening my eyes to, to Bitcoin. He was like, you know, we could do this for, for Bitcoin. I had the dream of doing it for Bitcoin. But then I was like, I mean, Bitcoin is even easier than the others. I mean, what is it to, in Bitcoin to do? I mean, what is difficult in Bitcoin? I, I don't get it. Because for me, all the other cryptos, by adding smart contracts and adding a few technical layers, were complicating a bit the thing. At the time, I thought also adding some some value. Um, but then Julian convinced me very easily. He was like, no, sorry, my mom, my dad, my family members, my friends, they just can't get into it. 
And there is this also solution in Switzerland where we could get into very easily without any KYC and get into Bitcoin. And that's really when I really started to read about Bitcoin and, and then go down the rabbit hole. And uh, while implementing, while working on, on Relay at the side and, and, and learning all these things at the same time uh, was quite an amazing time. And uh, that would be a bit of a summary of my rabbit hole story. Wow. So... <laughs> It's it's ironic. Whenever I speak, I call it a bit a techie's dilemma. Like if mm. people are very you know technical, they know um, how to solve very complex problems easily. You always try and make it harder, essentially. So exactly, <laughs> there always has to be something like yeah, you know, maybe I challenge myself a bit more um, to do these things. Um, but in the end, it was the simplicity that convinced you. And if you look at Relay today, so first of all, you, you're you entirely mobile based, like there's no web app solutions. We also talk about this with Julian. Um, yet, I don't know, maybe you guys will yet. do it one day. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then secondly, it's a very simple product so that I can recommend it to my grandparents, which I have done, for example, or I can recommend it to someone drunk at 2 a.m. in the bar and they will actually somehow manage to get their fiat onto Relay and buy Bitcoin. Has that always been an intention of you guys? Or was there also a point where you went like, oh, you know, maybe we can make it a bit more sexier? No, I, always making it easy was was the way. So you just mentioned, so it seems that we passed the mom test, we passed the drunk test. So I think, I think that's, that's a very good sign. And this was also the challenge for me because it sounds like super obvious how to do the easy things from the outside, right? But that was exactly the challenge because for me, Bitcoin was not complex. I mean, I'm, I really worked in, in a few other projects where they had crazy stuff, uh, not bringing that much value, but they had crazy, technically speaking, a lot of uh, stuff that were pretty interesting. Um, but Bitcoin wasn't that complicated. So in the end, uh, it, it takes anyway quite some time whenever we want to implement any change in, in Bitcoin. Uh, for, for various reasons and for various good reasons, which is completely different in any other blockchain projects. When you have only one or two people leading the project, they just keep coming with new things all around. And, and technically, this is still exciting. This interests you a lot. So making Bitcoin easy was actually the hard part. I wanted to get into the mind of someone as technical as you, uh, Adam, in the sense that it seems it seems like a lot of tech people love a problem they love they love something to work out and um try to find a solution to and something scratched my mind when you, when you were talking about when you were talking to julian about oh, bitcoin is too easy was you just trying to look for more more kind of puzzles and problems to to resolve in in the crypto space that i suppose were they necessary to even uh, were those problems even necessary to resolve in the first place are we just making things more complicated than they need to be in the ecosystem that is crypto and or Bitcoin? Yeah, they, with uh, with a hand science, hindsight, I don't think they were necessary. But as you said, we, we like this. We like the challenge, especially if you're self-driven, uh, quite autonomous, and you want to build things uh, on your own. These are amazing challenges and you want to keep them coming without really thinking too much long term and what kind of value they might potentially bring or not. And and again, here the main difference is when you compare Bitcoin to all the other crypto projects, all the other crypto projects, they are startups. They have a CEO, they have some investors, they need to make money. And that's that's a difference that initially might not seem like so important, but that that's that's key. And and all these other projects in terms of, of excitement. So look look at how far we are with, with lightning. I mean mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of people are working on Lightning. It's been years, but it's not that easy because we depend on the f on, 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 on L1, on the layer, on the main layer. You're quite limited on what you can do. It's the same for us. We can talk about a few examples, but I would say, unfortunately, we there are still some best practices we don't follow when it comes to Bitcoin mm -hmm. uh, because that complicates the things. But even even Bitcoin that we think is simple is already pretty much complicated. But the others mm -hmm. are extra complicated, which I think is really not necessary. But in the tech world, 
that's what we do all day. So we are looking for problems and that's what excites us. We just want to write code to, uh, it's the same what I did in bioinformatics for five, six years where I was just writing code all day long, basically just Perl scripts or Python scripts to read files and in the end to find something meaningful in this. Because for biologists, they were just doing experiments in the lab and sending us a file. They didn't know even what was that file about or they wouldn't understand anything. And it was on us to give a meaning to, to this file, a potential meaning. And uh, and I think that's the same that's happening right now when you compare Bitcoin to, to other cryptos. I wonder if, I'm, I'm trying to think of Satoshi Nakamoto here um, in, in his, um, what a lot of people refer to, particularly the likes of Knut, as a discovery, uh, Bitcoin being a discovery of having these existing elements uh, that were always present um, ever since cryptography began began and then all of a sudden um this discovery of, of bitcoin came to be and I, I suppose um unless I'm, I'm being too romantic here in my thought process <laughs> um is 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 that thanks to the mindset of a lot of tech people that they're, they're trying to find something um in this in this technical world and in, in, in the coding uh, and maybe that was a contributing factor into why bitcoin was discovered in the first place it Definitely has a role, uh, but I think that's not on the only thing. What what Satoshi did uh, is that they shipped it. I mean, this sounds too easy. You're like, what? I mean, what is it about shipping? Obviously, they they would they would they would go for it, or he would go for it, or she would go for it. Whatever Satoshi would go for it. But that's very very important and very tricky to do when you are in in the tech world. Mm. Satoshi could have waited for Segwit, could have waited for Lightning, could have waited for Taproot. Could I mean, the, the list is, I mean, we are still working on Bitcoin, right? After so many years. And that's a big dilemma we have in uh, in the tech world. There, I have a folder f that is called TMP, just for temporary, that is full of old archived projects I never finished. Like you're just keeping, you're, you're, you're a bit uh, perfectionist, it, especially if it's, a, if it's, if it's a, a product that you're building, like user-oriented product, retail-oriented product, and you just keep working on it every day. It's, there is no end, but you need to stop. You need to know when to stop and, and just ship it. And, uh, and obviously, we, we, we had improved the, the, the protocol a lot in the last few years, but this would have never happened if the first version was never released. So yes, there is this excitement and also the knowledge, obviously. I mean, I can be uh, as techy as I want. I will not come with uh, something like Bitcoin in the next few years because it's also not my domain. I could have come with a solution for bioinformatics, maybe something that could really bring it to the next level because based on, on, on my knowledge. But that's exactly what, what Satoshi could do, bringing the financial knowledge, economical aspect of it and the tech together and, and at least shipping it and not just keeping it there in a temporary folder or in a forum somewhere that we would just uh, forget forever. Who knows? Maybe Bitcoin was in a temp folder for a long time or, or hers or it. <laughs> <laughs> could have been. I, I wouldn't. Jeez. But I, yeah, it's definitely. That's the way it, 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 it happened for sure. But at least one yeah. day it's so version 1.0. And that's the one that is really making the whole difference. Yeah. And I mean, just speaking, like, I wouldn't categorize myself as a developer or anything, but I'm techy enough to, you know, read code, understand different languages and how things work. And what still amazes me is if people tell me, theoretically, you could still run Satoshi's code. It's buggy as fuck. It's apparently slow as fuck. It's not well written, but it still works. And after all these years, he sits, he, she, it, they, whatever, um, <laughs> still have impact in, into the whole system. Um, and also what a lot of, you know, um, Bitcoin devs told me, there is no limitation in Bitcoin in the sense that if you know certain languages, you can contribute. If you know certain aspects, you can contribute. You're not locked and loaded. Which, if I look to other crypto projects, sometimes you have to know um, Solidity or Rust to even work in that field. And um, over here, I think you have a bit more, um, bit more flexibility. Um, speaking of tech stuff, Adam, from your standpoint, what do you think is still missing? Because you touched on it previously in the Bitcoin space that you would wish see come into it, whether that be more venture money, 
technically speaking, a lot of more interest from VCs? Or is it maybe something technical you feel we need to, to even get further than what we are right now? What a question. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm, I'm totally biased and I would obviously love um, anything that would be uh, end user oriented. So um, we, we don't realize it yet, but we are, I mean, we do as Bitcoiners because we just repeat it to ourselves all day long. We are still early and that, that's true. We are still early because we still, we are still uh, discussing around details at the protocol layer, what we should change, what we should not change, what could be good, what wouldn't help, uh, which is fine. Uh, that's also how the internet started. That's, that's, that's quite normal for all these things, but we don't have enough uh, developers or enough project in the Bitcoin world that are thinking maybe a bit uh, higher level. We think too much low level. We don't think that much high level, high level meaning the protocol will work in a way or another. Uh, like obviously some of the progresses played a big impact in, in adoption, but not all of them. Most of them were fine because they helped or they were just anticipating a bit what is to come. Uh, but for example, if we didn't have Taproot, we would still have Relay. Uh, if we didn't have Segwit, we would still have Relay. I mean. I'm oversimplifying because I don't want to say that these are not necessary. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is we have these OGs, this core team working on these specific things, which is amazing, which they should keep working on until it becomes a proper standard. And, uh, and actually there is, a, there is not, there is not an end for such progress, but we also need a bit more on the high end, meaning thinking in terms of end users, thinking in terms of businesses thinking in terms of investors as you said so it's not that money should flow in directly to the core team which it should um but still uh we will not get too far if we just think in terms of uh, of protocol the protocol is one part of the of the hyper bitcoinization uh, reaching out to users explaining them even the educational aspect is something very big that we tend to to forget for a bit so uh, i think there is still a lot of work to be done there and obviously a bit of money helps in in all this uh, in all this aspect uh but we have i think enough uh well enough we have a lot of um uh self-driven and excited Bitcoin developers uh, that are ready to build all these things. We have all the tool belt and, 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 and that we need, uh, but then we still need a few more. We need more competition. We need more really uh, retail users targeted and specific uh, projects uh, because I think that's, that's a pity. I'm, I'm happy we are part of this uh, group at, at Relay, but um, I, I really want to see more. And this can go to the details like uh, Lightning, I mean, the progress that has been made, uh, again, it's the same. In Lightning, there, we are working on Lightning since 2018, announced even earlier, 2015. Um, we keep working on, on, on many things on Lightning, but in the end, the end user is still not seeing much. That's what we are missing. Could you give us, because I know there's been quite a lot of development and growth within the Lightning network. Mm -hmm. And um, could you give us a little bit of a, a summary about what developments have um, been um, had on, on the Lightning Network since its conception? Sure. So there's been a lot happening lately, actually, even uh, even this year. Uh, it's been crazy how, how things have changed. So we we are obviously close to Lightning or interested in the topic since we launched. When we launched, we were uh, very uh, lucky and very happy to have a lot of OGs around us that supported us and that are still supporting us because it was very important for us to keep uh, two aspects in mind when we launched, which one of them is the no KYC aspect and the other is the non-custodial aspect. So non-custodial meaning that you own and you control your own keys. We can't do anything, even if really goes bankrupt, no risk to, to lose any, any funds or, or anything like that. 
And because we were obviously since the beginning uh, supported by by all these OGs, like day one, the question was when Lightning. And even at the time when we started looking at it, it was just not ready for us to be implemented. Even earlier this year, I can go as far as earlier this year, we just slowly saw some progress happening on the non-custodial part and on the liquidity part of it. So it's, it's again, it goes back to what I said around, around Bitcoin. It takes quite some time to build the base layer here, the base layer being the, the lightning the L2, um, before we can even build something on top that is directed to the, to the end user. So technically, if you go to the details, you need to deal with channels when you're on lightning, uh, dealing with one channel can be fine, but when you need to deal with hundreds or thousands, it's another business you need to deal with, uh, with liquidity. I cannot send you one Bitcoin before I open a channel for at least one Bitcoin between you and me, and maybe even more. So all these aspects that don't make it easy uh, for a day-to-day -day use, but that's what Lightning is for, for more day-to-day -day, day -day use. So I think uh, that the progress has been made in the last few months, and um, I can give a few names because we've been in touch also with, uh, with all of them since the beginning. Uh, be it uh, John Carvalho with the Synonym sign team, uh, Roy with the Breeze and the Breeze SDK, the Voltage team. Uh, we've been in touch with uh, with all of them since the beginning and, and, and they were also aware of our problems. So that's exactly, I think, how it should work. And obviously we were not the only one with these problems. And, and thanks to, again, coming up with problems, uh, these um, Lightning OGs have been working around and looking for for solutions and uh, the solutions are things like lsps for example an lsp is a lightning service provider it's a third party who will handle all the the channel management the the, the sending the, the all these things that are quite complicated still on on lightning or that you don't want to deal with uh, they will handle it for you for a, for a small fee uh, or also the non-custodial aspect. So far, you need to have your, you always need to have your own Lightning node. Um, custodial solutions are out there, and and I'm glad they are out there. We we really need them. They help tremendously with uh, with adoption. But since the beginning, we've been uh, into non-custodial, and we are not uh, changing that anytime soon. And we'd rather be waiting for a proper non-custodial lightning solution than going with a custodial solution that is not only technically already challenging, but also legally speaking, it has a lot of other challenges because you're holding funds. So it's not only the technical aspect, but there are a, a few more uh, problems, if I may say, when it comes to, to lightning in a custodial way. So for us, it was more like giving enough data or information to all these OGs that are actually working and are excited to come up also with non-custodial solutions. And this year it's happening. I can clearly say that this year there is a lot of progress being made and we're really looking forward to uh, to getting started and, and get our hands dirty and see where we can go when it comes to a, a non-custodial Lightning wallet. Because I imagine even if you enable it and um... You know, I'm just thinking of probably the easiest way, like, I don't know, there will be a place in the app. This is like our node, uh, our channel ID, sorry. If you want to connect, connect. Um, or like, if you want to pay out, you, you buy, obviously the same way you do now, Apple Pay, Google Pay, whatever, uh, bank transfer, and then just give us your LN Pay address. And, you know, there are different ways of doing this. And then you sort of get into like, well, if they provide us an LN pay, we don't actually care if it's custodial, non-custodial. Um, and I guess that's sort of the, the issues you're facing currently. But in an ideal world, I guess it would be as simple as it is now in the Relay app. Um, probably to buy, because I imagine regulatory, if, if I'm selling, God forbid, if I'm selling my Bitcoin... Um, <laughs> before I get attacked somewhere on the internet mm -hmm. for saying this. Um, I guess that's a bit more a regulatory issue than buying Bitcoin because you go into fiat instead of going out, right? But ideally, hit a button, send the money, maybe within seconds or maybe with the next batch, your funds will be released. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, exactly. So you mentioned a few things about how Lightning could already currently work. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we don't want to do. And for a specific reason. So we don't want to share anything about Lightning in the app. The channel ID, what is the channel ID? Oh, Ellen Pay, Ellen URL, what, what is this? Why do I need to withdraw? I want to be a real user. Why do I need another app? Oh, I need to install another app, which is a Lightning wallet, so I can I pay at Relay, but then I receive, I buy my Bitcoin at the shop, but then it's another shop that is giving me the Bitcoin. All of these, which are already technically possible, we could already go, as you said, out with a, you can just tell the users, okay, you use whatever you want for Lightning wallet, then just withdraw your funds directly there. But again, we are talking about Bitcoiners. We are again, not making it easy. Our users, 99% of our users are not asking for lightning. They are asking for a faster settlement of their transaction. And that's, that's, that's a very neat distinction here because they don't know what is lightning. They don't care what is lightning. They just paid us and they want to receive what they paid for instantly, which is their, their, their rights. Right now, because we use on-chain, uh, we are batching and there is a bit of uh, delay until they, they receive their, their Bitcoin, uh, which we try to explain with uh, some uh, UI UX uh, tricks in the app. So they still know that, okay, we got the money, we exchange it, no worries, it's coming in the next batch and all. Uh, but this is not working uh, exactly as, as we intended. Our, uh, our motto from the beginning was get your first Bitcoin in less than a minute. You can right now install the app, create an order, pay in less than a minute with Apple Pay, Google Pay credit card, but you would still need to wait a bit to receive your Bitcoin. And this last part will be solved with, with Lightning. But again, our users, they just want to pay and they just want to see some sats incoming to their wallet instantly. That's it. So that's why all the details that you mentioned, either we handle them in the background, which is a lot of extra work, or we rely on this other uh, lightning projects that are working on it, that are really uh, focusing on the user experience more than the, 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 the protocol level, or, I mean, they, they have both knowledge, which is what they need. But for us, it's uh, the three of us, we talk about lightning. Uh, most of the, the listeners will know about lightning, but for the relay users, we are not talking about lightning. We are talking about a faster, settlement of, of a Bitcoin transaction. And because you mentioned it uh, quickly, there is also obviously the legal aspect. So uh, at Relay, we cannot just send uh, Bitcoin anywhere. We need just to know that, oh, Joel, you just buy, bought some Bitcoin with us. Is this really a wallet address you can control so that we can send it there? But again, that's just a technical thing that is pretty easy to do with, uh, with on-chain, with, uh, with Bitcoin wallets. And, and there are solutions for Lightning as well. So that's not really a, a big problem. It's very encouraging to, to hear you talk about the collaborative work that you're doing with the likes of Breeze and all the others that you mentioned. And something you mentioned in your um, initial rabbit hole story about uh, being in academia, was there a lot of collaboration in academia or was it very kind of solitary and then you're on your own type thing? The, the, there is both. So when I first, I was doing my, my master. I went to the Netherlands to finish, to, to do my master thesis. And I wasn't planning to do a PhD at the time, but the, the research group I joined was really interesting and they were all into collaboration. So they would just, they, they would have big groups to work together and implement standards and, and really find, find solutions. And that's exactly what I liked. I was like, wow, that's what I want to do. Uh, research is really where like basically everything is, is just born. That's really where all these ideas, the iPhone, the computers, Bitcoin, all of these are coming from research. You need research to start before even coming to the industrial aspect of, uh, of a topic. It all, everything starts with, with research. That's what excited me. And I saw the collaboration. I was like, look, that's what I want to do. Then I, I, I found uh, my PhD position in, uh, in Lausanne, at, in, in Switzerland at the university. And I started there and already from day one, I felt that it was not the case. So it was different there. 
depends on which group you're working, what the, the, the mentality or the business of the professor. My, my professor there was really a lot into publishing in very high journals like Science, uh, Nature, all these big journals where you get really also uh, famous after publishing in these journals. And there you need to be a bit more careful, you need to be fighting a bit more and um, not share that much, which which I did quite the opposite. I I like to I like to be on stage. Uh, I'm not that much anymore, but during my my PhD, I did a lot of conferences all over the the, the world, and and I really like to present my project. And I was not aware that actually our competitors were just sitting there and listening to me. Uh, and even if I was aware, I would be like. Yeah, but what can they do? I mean, the worst we can do is just that we would discuss and then find and uh, the worst huh? and collaborate in the end. But no, just uh, two years in my PhD, just before Christmas holiday, my colleague in the next uh, office comes to two hours and he's like, oh, Adam, I, there is something you need to check. And, and then he shows me these two papers in, in Science, which is an amazing journal, by the way. Uh, and then they just published almost exactly what I was working on. The thing is, once it's published, then you can throw away whatever you had because it doesn't have any value anymore. It's the first one who publishes it, so it's publish or perish. The first one who publishes some results, they just got all the fame and everything, and then you can just throw away whatever you were doing. Uh, and this happened, and that was quite a shock, but it's not everywhere the case. But unfortunately, it's, it's becoming a bit more common because there is, it's quite uh, a thing to become a professor now. So places are uh, limited and it requires a lot of, of hard work and a lot of competition. You cannot make it there like you can, obviously, if you're still into collaboration and all, but it's getting really, really difficult. And, and that's a bit unfortunate. The bioinformatics side that, uh, of things that you did, is there any overlap whatsoever um, that you can see in the Bitcoin space and, and your expertise in, in bioinformatics? Is there any kind of similarities or overlap at all? Mm -hmm. So not directly with Bitcoin, but with programming in general or computers. So to me, there are two types of DNA. So we have the human DNA with nucleotides ATGC, and we have the computer DNA with binaries zeros and ones. And in the end, Bitcoin is also all around binaries and, and computers, and it's a system. And it also goes even a bit further away with bringing into the, the economical aspect, the financial aspect. So for me, it was, I initially wanted to become a, an MD, a doctor, um, and was quite challenging in France. You have this first year, which is a, a competition. Basically, it's not like there are limited seats and you have to be in the top uh, 100 or something uh, to, to make it happen. I missed it by a few places and I could do dentist and I was like, no, I don't want to do dentist. <laughs> so then I moved to biology because there was still this aspect of the anatomy. So a living organism that is changing, that is adapting and this will always come with problems and challenges. It's not fixed. So that's why I was really interested in it. And just this is something that could keep me busy my, my whole life. Uh, it's a never ending uh, system. And the same, I could do the same with, uh, with computers. So obviously we can think that computers are a bit limited, right? But it's not true because if you think in terms of the, the alphabet is much simpler, it's just zeros and ones. But in the end, what you can do is also very, very advanced and very complicated. And now with AI, machine learnings and all these systems, you can see also with, with new, maybe next level computers, whatever it is, uh, you can see that it's also uh, an always uh, ongoing uh, system which comes with, with challenges. And, and that's why I, I, for me, these two worlds were, were quite similar. And I was pretty lucky because at the time, bioinformatics was quite new. I think they opened the master just one year before I joined. Uh, so I was quite on time and it was just combining the two domains. I was in love with biology and uh, informatics and that was just a perfect match. And it m obviously might have played in, uh, in my rabbit hole without me realizing because in the end, uh, Bitcoin today is about freedom, about bringing people together, about giving a chance to the others. 
And when you keep in mind biology, informatics, bringing together for a better world, in the end, it, it was always in, in the back of my head. Do you think, because you are obviously as a CTO, like you, I mean, first of all, you're the co-founder and then you are the CTO. So you kind of have two positions within the company as probably the, the second boss, <laughs> if like the decision comes and you're the guy to talk to if there's changes. Do you think your mentality, because you said you like to collaborate a lot, is also being brought into the team? Because I spend a lot of time with um, sort of the legal and sales slash marketing part of your team. But from the stories I've heard, you're all very open. I mean, your your team get togethers seem to be quite funny as well. Um, is that an important aspect of the Relay team, like collaborate more instead of, you know, being locked in your own home and trying to figure out stuff on your own? Or has that just evolved naturally because all of you got along? No, no, I think it's it was part of our DNA from the beginning, uh, part of our culture from the beginning. So when we when we first met with uh, with Julian, it was still just an ID and uh, we would eat a lot and, and work a bit and we had ups and downs. So we what we did was a hackathon where we brought a bit of code and then we were waiting for a few more months, see what we could do and all. And we, we realized that this was not working. We just had to stop everything and only do relay if we want to give it a chance because we were not doing any favor to us and also not to the to the project because we both had our own businesses going on at the same time. So what Julian did was find his very first investors that would give us a bit of money that we could stop everything and just focus on, on, on Relay for a few months. And a few months was actually just three months and where I would just code and he would do all the rest. And we agreed that whatever happens at the end of the three months, which was July the 3rd, 2020, we will just release this app out. And that's what we did. So that's how it started. That's also why I mentioned earlier the fact that you just need to ship it, just ship it. And that's something I also want to mention to any developer out there. Seriously, just ship it. Uh, it will never be perfect. We are far from being perfect, even after three years and such a big team and an amazing team. Uh, but we are getting there. Uh, and um, about the, 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 the fun aspect or the culture aspect, we were always very open. So in the end, we were also learning at the same time. Uh, Julian had a few other businesses before, uh, me too, but at a much, much smaller scale, right? We've never had a 20 plus uh, team. Uh, and here, what we did was being completely open from the beginning. We were very transparent about what we were doing. I mean, yes, the, the, the code is not open source. I'm, I'm already mentioning it because some users might be like, yeah, you guys are open, but you are not open. But this obviously comes with a few other business aspect. Uh, but other than uh, the open source part of, of the code, we've always been very open to discuss and, and to share things. We've never been really hiding things because we really believed in the, in the, in the, in the, in the power of the community. And actually, most of the team is coming from the community. This is crazy. I mean, we just reach out. We So that's why don't hesitate to reach out to me or Julian, whoever, mm. wherever you are, because this is already a good chance for you to potentially <laughs> join the team. Uh, but that's exactly how and, and what happened for for maybe more than half of the team. They would just reach out and they would just show how much excited they were about the project and then what they could bring, what kind of value they could bring. And we could see it and have and have the team the, the this person joining our team. So this started very early on. Uh, and already two years ago, we started also with Team Summit. We do Team Summit twice a year. We were in Istanbul two a month ago, not even two months ago, for a week with the whole team. And this plays a big we, we are a fully remote team. We have mm -hmm. a small local team in Switzerland, let's say around five, six people where we meet once a week in the office, but the rest is uh, completely remote. And we still meet uh, twice a year with the whole team, whatever it takes, we just bring the whole team together because this is very, very uh, helpful for for uh, to, to have stronger bounds. And, and this has been always the case since the beginning. We never really, not that we didn't took it seriously. Obviously, mm. we take it very seriously. Uh, it's um, sometimes it can be very tough. So uh, for the fun part, 
we have a, a little boy. He's now three years old. He's uh, my only real like human children. <laughs> but at the same time, I have really as well. And the fun part is my son, my real son was born in uh, June 27th. 2020 and we launched Relay in July the 1st, 2020. I don't know how I did it, why I did it, but <laughs> you can see that for the first year I had Relay growing and I had this baby at home growing. So it was quite a challenge, but it was so exciting that we never really, the good thing is we never really, we struggle, but we just like the struggle. Mm -hmm. And this, this, it's not something that we would complain about or, you know, go outside and be like, oh, whatever, this is just complicated. What are we doing here? It's just that it's part of, of the way we work. And, and it's amazing that this is also the case for the whole team. And I think we had this, this strong human connection first helps tremendously. And, uh, it played a big role in, uh, whenever we had someone joining in, uh, we also had this without maybe realizing initially, but it was very important for us that first we have a good human connection and also that this person really wants to bring in some, some value. That's why I say don't hesitate to reach out if, uh, if you are interested and you feel like you can bring any value to, to relay, please just ping us. We're always more than happy to discuss and have a chat around. And who knows, maybe you will be the next one joining the team. Joel and I have had the luxury of speaking to most of the relay team now, uh, right. rabbit hole stories. <laughs> and, and, um, it's, it's inspiring to, to hear each and what, every one of you talk so positively about what relay is and what it's trying to achieve and um you guys are smashing it in the space and I, I wish you guys the very best of luck in in the relay team uh because you're, you're, you. you're obviously doing things uh in the right way in the ethical way and and you've got your minds focused on the fundamentals of bitcoin i think but talking about the fundamentals of bitcoin um and a bit of a think boy question coming up in the sense that <laughs> Where, where do you do you do you ever have any fantasies about what Bitcoin might bring to the world and what what good it might um, bring to the world long term? Not necessarily in your lifetime, but what's the kind of fantasy you've got about Bitcoin? Yeah, I do have one, and uh, I think it's it's a one that I share with most of the Bitcoiners that we call hyper Bitcoinization, and we might have all of us a different definition of what hyper Bitcoinization is. What I just want is uh, is a more fair world. So um, it was very striking after our son was born that uh, I need to build something. I need to build a future where I can see him uh, growing and see him thriving and, and being happy, uh, which is not the case today. Let's let's just be honest. I mean, looking at the, the economical aspect, financial aspect, the the the, the leaders, quote unquote, that we have are not bringing us uh, anywhere. And that's exactly not where I want to see my son in, uh, in 20 years. Maybe 20 years is too short. Maybe it's, it's pretty much enough. We'll see this. I don't know. But it's a world where we are more fair to each other, where we don't need to fight for a piece of paper. Uh, where we don't need to bribe someone just to get something. Um, all of these things I am unfortunately quite uh, aware of, and I had to go through basically all of them in, in, my, in my lifetime. Uh, I'm 38 years old. I have Turkish origins, so I know what Turkey is going through. I know what the Turkish lira has been going through. Uh, I used to have uh, millions in Turkish lira. I used to pay. I remember days when I was paying a bread one million Turkish lira. Uh, I had to bribe some people here and there, not especially only in Turkey, but in in a few other countries, just not to have any problem. You know, just to be like, look, guys, here is your five euros bill. Just leave me alone. Uh, although it was their job. They don't need this extra five euro bills, but, but look, in the end, they're, they were fighting for something else and, uh, not that I understand it and I accept it, but, uh, it, it all of this is coming also from 
a a problem that we have at 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 at, a, at, a, at another level. So it's not only us. We are led like this. We used to grow like this, and there are a lot of things that we consider normal that shouldn't be. And uh, <clears throat> and that's why I think. Uh, we we really really need Bitcoin, and that's what Bitcoin will uh, will solve, and that's why I think we need to really now start thinking in terms of end users how they can get to to Bitcoin. Not only in the technical aspect, that's what we're trying to do at Relay. That's what we will still keep doing, but also on the educational aspect. We first need to tell them what the problem is or what the problems are uh and then the rest will come i mean obviously when they will come we need the tools but that's why we are here today we are building the tools or the bridges like we we would like to to name them between this old world and the new world uh we need a bridge to to cross uh that's what we at really and all other bitcoin companies startups are are doing today but before crossing the bridge you need to be convinced that you need to cross the bridge right uh for us in in the bitcoin world it looks like why do we even need to convince them it's it's just obvious it's out there believe me it's not believe me it's not it's far from being obvious and and we like to to joke around about it and what's the next thing and you know all these things but at in the end uh when you are in your even in turkey they ask me like oh if it's that obvious if the economy is crashing that much, why aren't all the Turkish people into Bitcoin? But that's the thing, they don't realize it. Like they are like, look, and they're also very um, uh, nationalist. So uh, they believe, they, they they give everything to their government. They, they know for sure that they, they will save them if needed, uh, but they don't realize the problem is, is the government. And they're like, look, yeah, the, the, the Lira is not doing well, but my salary doubled since last year, even if the bread is also twice as much, but my salary doubled. So in the end, I don't see any problem. I'm fine. If it triples and then my salary triples, then I'm, I'm fine as well, right? Because in the end, I'm not earning less. But, but these are all the problems that we might realize a bit easy uh, as, 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 as Bitcoiners, because we are into it, we read, we try to understand, we put the effort, let's say, but we cannot expect everybody to, to put the effort and... Uh, and do as much research as we do. So education has also a big uh, role to, to play in here, which we're also trying to, to do as much as possible at Relay mm. with our newsletters, with our blog posts, uh, but there's still some work to do for sure. So bef before we wrap things up, Adam, if if people approach you, they can be pre-coiners, they can maybe have a first touch point with Bitcoin. What is the number one thing you like to guide them towards? It can be an article, it can be a book, heck, it can even be a video or whatever. Um, what would you like to give people out in the world if they want to get serious about Bitcoin to get going? Yeah, that's a very good question. I am lately, I think I've, I've been like taking a lot of time to, <laughs> to listen almost all the podcast from uh, Daniel Prince, nice. uh, the Once Bitten podcast. Uh, because I really like his approach, and uh, and even by having Lauren and in, in the podcast and her asking questions, it's like we are not and 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 she really comes like she really brings another level to the mm -hmm. discussion. And if we could, and actually that could be a good thing for for Daniel to just have one session where he would cut all her questions and have just one long podcast with only her questions and the answers, that brings another level to Bitcoin. Because, again, you asked me a very good question. Let's say if my dad was to come to me, which he did already, but obviously I, I, I managed to, to orange peel a bit easily with, uh, with Relay, but more around discussion and all. So I, I never really used any resources. So he doesn't speak English, so he wouldn't anyway get so too technical and all. He's really not into it. So something that is very easy for him in his language was pretty tricky to find mm. uh, which is a bit unfortunate but I know it's coming so something that I did very recently and I still need to play with it I'm checking my phone because I can't remember the name it's simple Bitcoin mm -hmm. uh, I found out about this project a week ago and they do something very close to 
Duolingo, which is this app to learn a new language in a, in a very funny way. And they have this similar uh, UI, which is, which is very nice. And the same approach, which is explaining Bitcoin to, uh, to newbies. So um, I think if such apps can uh, make it happen, like what would be very helpful, obviously, is more and more languages. Mm -hmm. uh, this, is, this is definitely the way to go. So a bit of gamification. It, it has to be very, very easy. You cannot go there with a very steep learning curve, because if you want to explain them what is happening uh, at the economical level and all, I mean, look, my dad would listen to me for 20 minutes and then he would be like, look, son, I love you, but I am 64. I am getting soon uh, <laughs> retired. Look, have fun and, and let, let me do what I know uh, at, at best. So um, savings a bit here and there, and, and that's it basically. And getting my retirement and living my, my life. So it has to be it has to be very easy and uh, and right now i think we are lacking a bit such mm -hmm. uh resources again i mentioned a few a few of them where where they can they can bring a lot of fresh air let's say i cannot tell my dad to go follow Saifedean or <laughs> sailor or, or 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 whoever you know that won't work um but but there are a few options but we need more we need more mm -hmm. we need more um uh, the entrance barrier should be should be very easy as easy as again i believe a lot in the mobile platform that's why i'm so excited and that's why we launched relay obviously uh, today everything is an app so if you want to go there and convince someone you need an app for that uh, it sounds maybe a bit too simplistic uh, but it helps tremendously yeah, and I mean, who knows, you know, maybe you will have a Relay Vision Pro app very soon where you can, like, get your goggles on. And... Right, <laughs> right, right. And uh, do it this way. <laughs> Adam, I don't want to hold you up any longer because I know it's after work and after hours. Um, where's the best place where people can reach out to you? Is it Twitter, Nostra? What's the resource? I'm very active on Twitter and my handle is underscore Adam Bilijan underscore, which is my family name. Uh, but if they just look at the Relay account or they search for, for my family name, they will find it. I don't think there are, there are many Billy Jan in the world. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll definitely link it in the show notes. I appreciate it. And a bit on Noster, but not that active. Mm. I, I need, and Noster again is like, uh, I'm using the Damos app, which is fantastic. I know they've been struggling a bit with the app store and all lately. Uh, I wish them good luck, but, uh, but they are really strong. Uh, I'm also. Uh, quite active there, a bit less than Twitter, but uh, I should be a bit more active there, let's put it that way. So follow me there as well, which will trigger me also to be more active. Perfect. There. Adam, thank you for allowing us on this a fascinating journey down your Bitcoin rabbit hole. It's been a pleasure having you on Rabbit Hole Stories and uh, I wish you all the best and I'll see you no doubt soon at some conference somewhere or whatever. But uh, in the meantime, take care, my friend. I appreciate it. The pleasure was mine. Thank you very much, Joel. Thank you, Ian and see you around.